Today's episode of Necronomapod is brought to you by Beardology. There are a lot of imitators out there, but there's only one place I buy my beard oil. Beardology beard oil nourishes your skin and won't leave you with that greasy feel. With over 17 cents available in their extensive product line, I trust my beard to Beardology. You can find Beardology at beardology.co. Use code NECRO15 to receive 15% off your purchase. Beardology, discover the best way to avoid the shave. In part two of our conversation about Jonestown, we discuss the cruel and humiliating punishments Jim Jones would bestow upon members who he deemed hostile. We'll also discuss the ways Jones continued to manipulate his followers and gain new ones, growing Jonestown to heights it had never reached before. We'll also take a look at Jones's growing political influence throughout the 1970s. What first lady did he rub elbows with? I'm Mike. I'm Ian. And I'm Dave. If you've ever cucked a man and forced him to write a humiliating letter acknowledging you fathered his son, stick around. You and Jim Jones have more in common than you thought. This is Necronomapod. It's hard. I'm preaching my heart out. But look at that 93-year-old before you do and see how healthy he looks. Look at what I do for my people. He was in jail. They were stuck up several thousand dollar bills on him. And I paid it that minute. And I said, you won't go back. And he didn't. That's the kind of father I am. What kind of father have you been serving lately? Does your churches have any love? Does your preacher talking about the sky God? Will he give you a ride? Will he give you any buses? Has he given you any of those homes? Has he given you help? Does he go into the court and the jails and set you free? Does his, does his sky Jesus do you any good? No! I'm the only one that'll help you! I'm the only one that cares about you! I'm the only one that loves you! So the madness continues. Part two. Yeah, so last time when we left off, we were hinting at, at Jim starting to use drugs to uh, to keep himself going. Wait, you mean the story gets crazier? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to yeah, it's going to take a turn here. So yeah, jumping right into it. Jim Jones, he had to keep control of everything concerning the people's temple. I mean, he was doing the books, doing all the logistical stuff. Like he he did delegate stuff to certain people eventually, but he was in control of everything. And then on top of that, he was doing multiple sermons a day and then doing meetings at night. So I mean, he had to be on point at all times. Like 20 hour days. Yeah. Plus all that fuck schedule you got to keep up. Exactly. We talked yeah. about last episode. There's a lot going on. And there's meetings to a, have and women to do. appointment in the fuck schedule. <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> so that's where uh, massive amphetamine abuse comes in. We we talked about it a little bit on the last one. If, if you're a paranoid person and you're an asshole, amphetamines are just going to boost that. I mean, it just basically boosts your personality, you know. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. So he goes from a dick to a total dick. Oh yeah, and the well, and the paranoia is a big thing with with the speed effect. make you paranoid. Yeah. Okay. And if you're already super paranoid, it's gonna throw that through the roof. It amplifies it. Yeah. yeah. But he needed to sleep sometimes too, so to come back down from the amphetamines, he would take quaaludes to fall asleep. <laughs> so it's just <laughs> it's like back concoction. and forth. From what I've read, quaaludes are the greatest thing in the history of uh, drugs. To fall asleep? To, to anything. It's too bad they quit making them. <laughs> oh, they don't make them anymore? No. I didn't know that either. Yeah. Just from reading about, you know, back in the 70s. Yeah. Which was before my time. No, it was absolutely <laughs> not. You would have been way too young to be doing drugs, so <laughs> at least there's that. From what I've read, quaaludes were fantastic. Remember the Wolf of Wall Street? Remember he found those... You know, I've never seen that movie. Oh, those special quaaludes yeah. when they were in slow motion crawling yeah. on the floor? <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, you said 70s. We're looking at, what, the early 70s at this right now when he starts dabbling in the, the, the drugs? Yeah. Yeah, early 70s, um, late 60s, early 70s. We should remind anyone that might be listening, if you've not heard Jonestown Part 1, go back and listen to that before you listen to this episode. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be you're gonna be catching us in halfway through the story. Yeah, what are you, an idiot? You started on Part 2? Get the <laughs> fuck out of here. <laughs> he said it, not me. So with all the, the drug use, that holds the key to the, the mystery of the sunglasses that he never took off. And because his eyes were so fucking bloodshot, red and teary all the time from all the drug abuse, he just looked like a fucking maniac. So, 
I just thought he was trying to be like Gene Simmons. (laughs) Gene Simmons wears sunglasses all the time. You know why? Because the sun never sets on Planet Cool. Is that a legitimate quote from him? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) It sounds like it's a legitimate quote. Um, Gene Simmons. He's the god of thunder. What are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. By the way, I saw the Kiss final tour about two weeks ago. Fantastic. It was amazing. It was so good. Anyone out there who's listening who's a Kiss fan, check them out on this tour. I've seen them for 20 years now, and this was the best they had ever been that I've seen them. Ian, amazing. Ian didn't go because he doesn't love Kiss, so he can go <laughs> suck it. Yeah, I don't. I only know like one song, I think. Well, you were busy that night. You were at the 98 Degrees concert. Mm-hmm. I was. <laughs> Who's the guy from 98 Degrees? Nick Lachey. Yeah. Mary Jessica Simpson for the a correct short answer time. to that question is I have no fucking <laughs> idea. Nick Lachey, and then what was his brother Drew? Was it Drew Lachey in the band too? There was there was he had his brother in it. I don't remember his brother's name. I have no fucking they idea. They were the throwaway boy band. Backstreet Boys and NSYNC were the shits. I'll take your word Top for it. Top shits. I meant that in a good way. They weren't <laughs> bad. They were the good shits. Very familiar with 98 Degrees for some, <laughs> some reason. Well, I know who they are. That was all in that same time period. Mm-hmm. I watched my share of TRL. Come on now. I was going to sing No Strings Attached, but I'd end up singing uh, uh, Smoke on the Water instead and mess it all up. <laughs> so, Jim, I mean, you got to think, too. People are like, prob- I would assume, wondering, like, hey, why the fuck are you wearing sunglasses inside at, like, 24 hours a day you're wearing sunglasses? And I think it's like, a little weird. It is weird because that's how I picture this guy. Like, that's the iconic image of him mm-hmm. yeah. with the sunglasses. Yeah. Right. So, if I mean, if he never wore them before and then he starts, it's, yeah. if you were a follower, you'd be like, wait, what, why are you wearing these all the time? It's cloudy, Jim. <laughs> or it's like nighttime and you're inside. Right. Like, what the fuck are you doing? So, his excuse was that he had reached a level of spirituality so high that if he looked at his followers without the glasses on, they would be burned by the godlike energy coming out of this his eyes. Motherfucker. And it piece should of have shit. ended here. <laughs> when he's telling people that, how are they responding? I you know, I was watching that the new documentary I was telling you guys about that that jungle mm. terror in the jungle one. There were people that were former members on their talk and it was just like they were just like the energy coming off of him and he was saying the right stuff and well, we had talked about he was a charismatic guy. Yeah. He was a great speaker. But it's like when someone says that to you, what are these people believing or thinking? But at this time, he'd already had people. He already had this. These people already believed everything he was selling. It's not it's I just mean, one step further. Yeah, I mean, it's you're not. already believing he can cure cancer right in front of you. Ugh, it's maybe all incremental. Worse. I mean, yeah. if he, he would have led with that, maybe you know, he would have lost some people. But. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he had okay. been already... He'd been already selling some really wild yeah. shit that people were buying into, but you know, the, and he still needed money at this time to to fund all this stuff. Um, so he was still hitting up the revival circuit, and he invested in a in a ton of decommissioned Greyhound buses, and they would start taking leave the driving to Jim. <laughs> <laughs> he was, was that an actual jingle or a song? Isn't that the Greyhound commercial? Leave the driving to us? Leave the driving to us? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. I think it is. (laughs) Maybe that was a commercial in the 70s. (laughs) Maybe I was doing Quaaludes when I I first saw it. He made me spit my drink out of my nose. (laughs) Six-year-old Dave doing Quaaludes, watching Greyhound commercials, having the time of his life. So, like, remember we were saying before in the last episode that he started out these the revival circus by just him being the plant and kind of listening to what people were saying, and then he got a few plants in there. But now with this this group of uh, Greyhound buses, he would take like three to four hundred people with him from the People's Temple. You know, they would all be pumped up for him already, and he would call an unknowing member of the audience now. To, and tell them that they had cancer. And they're like, oh, what the fuck? I have cancer. <laughs> like, no. What? 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 Like, what? Yeah, he wasn't using the normal plants. So he would get members of the People's Temple dressed like a nurse and like sleight of hand, like magic trick kind of shit would get the like, I'm, I'm assuming he would say, like, open your mouth, whatever. And and they would like slide this chick, the chicken guts, still using the chicken guts into this person's <laughs> mouth and the person would get sick. Could, you know, they're like, what the fuck just happened? And, and they, they would get up. sick and throw it up and then bam, the cancer's gone. 
Did the person, <laughs> the innocent bystander, not ever say, motherfucker, you just shoved chicken in my mouth? Or you just shoved something in they my mouth? They probably puked and they ushered them off stage. Yeah. And- well, you got to think there's thousands of people in there. So if everyone's like screaming and no one's listening to that, dude, you just threw up and everyone's... I just feel like I'd be more vocal if someone assaulted my mouth with chicken guts. <laughs> like, logistically, how do you do that? You just shove it. Is there video of any of this? Someone... Having the chicken got shoved in their mouth. No, this stuff would all come out later from mm. former members and stuff. I mean, I guess if you're if you're pretending to, if you're dressed as a nurse and you're like, open your mouth, let me take a look, and then you're like playing around in their mouth and you just drop that in. You're like, wait, something's coming up. And yeah. next you know the person's puking. Yeah. Low tech. I just feel it's like if, tech. if someone did that to me, I'd be all over the press and the newspaper. I'm like these motherfuckers just shoved chicken guts in my mouth or something <laughs> in my mouth and made me throw up. And they said I had cancer. Well, that was the other thing in that documentary I was watching last night. The one woman said that there was someone that she knew that had cancer. She really did go into a remission, but Jim had healed her. And she was like, that was like real. I mean, it, it, she actually did go into remission, but it came back. And she was like, well, I need to start believing in Jim more. And mm. she ended up dying from cancer because mm. she just thought that she could believe in Jim Jones. Bet Jim Jones didn't talk oh. about that one. No. Ridiculous. That would be freaking gross. Oh yeah, because you know they've been sitting in that Greyhound bus, like being yeah, all like in a little freaking sandwich bag in someone's pocket. Probably not refrigerated. No Ugh. salmonella, fucking <laughs> crawling all over it. Oh, we're gonna have to move on. <laughs> um, Need a quaalude to get over. <laughs> He's obsessed with his quaaludes. <laughs> He's so mad that this is, he missed out on the quaaludes. <laughs> um, to also make money at these things, he. He sold portraits of himself for five dollars a piece, and with that picture, it would guarantee people that they would receive protection from Jim wherever they were. <laughs> oh, naturally, and and if you bought more, you would more you were more protected. So the more you had, the better off I've you got were. Fifty pictures of Jim in my house. <laughs> yeah, he sold them for five dollars a piece, and they former members said that they would sell like six hundred of them a, a show. This asshole's making three grand in this revival tent from pictures. Maybe Just we should start selling our portraits. People can buy Necronomicon Necronom- portraits of us. Necronomicon portraits. Necronomicon portraits. Five we bucks can sign a, them. Five bucks a piece. You can get an individual one or one of all three of us for seven bucks. Like a, like a, you know, all of us in one photo for seven bucks. There or you, you can buy all three of our individual photos for 12 bucks. Cut you a deal. Of collector's yeah. editions signed. We'll, we'll number, absolutely number, sign them for an extra. edition. Yeah. Those will only be like 50. If you're interested in Necronama portraits, <laughs> hit us up. We'll make that happen. And he was also like, he was blessing pennies too. Like there's pictures out there, like cards that have like a penny on it that would supposedly give you protection in life. Mm, great. Are any of these portraits uh, surviving to this day? Are they worth anything? Is There's got to be historical some. Historical memorabilia. There's pictures of them online. If you really had one, that would be worth a fuck ton of money. Would it? Yeah, yeah. I was looking at memorabilia not that long ago. There's a, I can't remember the name of their website, but there's some website that sells all that, like, serial killer and yeah, this yeah. shit. There's a handwritten note from him with the envelope and everything. It was like $20,000. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, back in Redwood Valley with the uh, upper to middle class white people joining, Jim had to figure out a different way to manipulate them because what, what he... they. He couldn't make their life better. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. he like he was doing with black people. Right. And, and an example of this was that Jim had abandoned the idea that Russia was going to cause the nuclear war. And now he was saying that they were a socialist paradise and they would be an escape plan if they needed one. Russia was. Russia was a socialist paradise. Well, I don't think it was much of a paradise <laughs> in the early 70s. I'm going to reject that idea. Well, yeah, so during a really large uh, public meeting... One of these, you know, more educated followers called him out and was like, hey, there's like tons of people getting killed in Russia and, you know, it's not really a great place. And Jim just fucking blew up on him and just publicly humiliated this dude and just like tore him up. But then after the service, he pulled him aside and was like, hey, my followers aren't really the smartest people in the world, you know. <laughs> you <laughs> don't say. <laughs> hey, dude, can you dumb it down a little bit yeah. for my sermons here? Yeah. And they, but he would say he was like, he was like, you know. I need a guy like you. You're smart. You're probably even smarter than I am. So that's why I need you. You know, he's like, and if you ever hear something I'm saying that's wrong, 
he was like, just come and tell me, tell me off to the side and we'll figure it out. And that's how he did it with these smart, with, I guess, smarter, whatever people. Yeah. The would, intellectuals of the group. Yeah. He would pull them closer and like just kind of stroke their ego, yeah. you know. Flattery like, will get you everywhere. Yeah. He'd be like, oh, you're smarter than I am, man. So just keep it on the down low, but right. tell me in private. You can't call me out in public, you right. know. And like I said, it was just that one on one time would just like, oh, I mean, at that point, you're like borderline. God is giving me one on one time, you know, and telling me I'm I'm smart and stuff. He loves me. He really loves me. (laughs) So with pulling those type of people in, the most important guy he would come to meet would be a, a young guy named Tim Stone. And Jim knew that if he really wanted to expand the people's temple to the size that he wanted it to be, he would need a lawyer. And he did. He didn't just need any type of lawyer. He needed one that actually believed in the cause, and but more importantly, believed in Jim Jones. And he didn't even have to to really look far for for Tim Stone. He was the assistant DA for Mendocino County in Redwood Valley. Um, so that comes in handy. Yep. And Tim Stone immediately took to the social social message that Jim was preaching, and like everybody around Tim Stone, like he was just a really aggressive young lawyer. People were saying like he was going to be the next the DA, yeah, like the next you know super successful, and that's why everybody around him was like, "What the fuck are you doing? Like, why are you joining? You know, why are you?" Because it was really public. Like you had to be public and say like I am the member of the People's Temple because yeah. everyone knew about it. It wasn't like a hidden cult kind of thing, right? right. So it what what was it? it was the social message? The, yeah, the overall yeah um, uh, spew that Jim Jones was throwing out there. I think at, at this time. If you weren't coming from the revival, if he wasn't bringing you in from the revival circuit, it was the social message of everything. And um, getting this Tim guy adds a huge layer of legitimacy. So, oh yeah, absolutely. I'm sure he seeks people out, and he wouldn't be able to accomplish half of this shit if it wasn't for Tim right, Stone. Right. Since Tim was spending all of his time with Jim, his marriage to Grace Stone started to fall apart. And since Grace was lonely, she started talking to other people's temple members about her problems. But she didn't know that everybody kept notes on everything and would report it right back to Jim. So, and real, real housewives of people's temple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's where he saw his uh, his in with Grace and moved in. And eventually, Grace became pregnant, and the baby from that affair would be one of the. She became pregnant with Jim, Jim's child yeah yeah and that that baby would be the one of the big things that ended the people's temple his name he was born john victor stone on january 25th 1972 everybody called him john john i think the only reason that jim took to this kid the way he did was because it was a it was another thing to to use as a manipulation a prop yeah and inflate his ego even more over someone right because jim was having sex with tons of I mean he had the fuck schedule he was yeah, of course doing whatever he wanted it wasn't an empty fuck schedule well he left Jim room for packs. fill-ins got those wild cards out there walk-in appointments yeah <laughs> from noon to two on Saturdays he accepts walk-ins <laughs> <laughs> enter Greystone no well, literally he <laughs> entered Greystone <laughs> Well, and there was a lot of forced abortions going on because he didn't use protection. He was just getting women pregnant left and right, and then they would have to get abortions because he said with socialist beliefs, to, it was it wasn't a good thing to bring more children into this world. But John 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 was something that he could uh, he could manipulate because he could hold it over Tim's head, you know, and make him do what he wanted. Right? Because Tim was important. Gray Stone and Tim Stone are listed as the as John Victor's parents on his birth certificate but as far as the people's temple is concerned jim was the dad and jim forced tim stone to write just a ridiculously humiliating letter or an affidavit acknowledging that jim john was the biological father of john victor and sign it and then this one this is brutal and i don't know if it was just to rub it in or if this was just like this power trip going to the next level but he had marceline sign it as a witness yeah, just power like power trip for everybody, I yeah. imagine. Why do you think he had him write the letter? Just to hold over him? No, oh, yeah. And like admit like, oh, hey, I, I did this and you didn't. Yeah. Well, go ahead and read that that first paragraph of that, that affidavit. Really, the first paragraph I think is the only, the, the relevant, there's only one other paragraph. Yeah. But, so this is the letter that he had John Stone write um, and sign. Tim Stone. 
Tim, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the sun. John, John. Tim Stone, write and sign. And this will be in Mike's interpretive voice reading <laughs> of the voices. letter. <laughs> Why do you guys think I do voices over here? <laughs> I don't know what Tim Stone sounds like. I, Timothy Oliver Stone, hereby acknowledge that in April 1971, I entreated my beloved pastor, James W. Jones, to sire a child by my wife, Grace Lucy Stone, who had previously, at my insistence, reluctantly but graciously consented thereto. James W. Jones agreed to do so reluctantly after I explained that I very much wished to raise a child but was unable, after extensive attempts, to sire one myself. My reason for requesting James W. Jones to do this is that I wanted my child to be fathered, if not by me, by the most compassionate, honest, and courageous human being the world contains. Signed, Timothy Oliver Stone. Does that have Marcel? Does that have Marcelins on the side too? It's got uh, Tim Stones, and then dated February 6, nineteen seventy two, and then witnessed by Marcelin. Yeah, mm. yeah, that's brutal. Mm-hmm. It's brutal for Tim. I mean, it's demoralizing, but it's, it takes it to a whole different level having Marcelin sure. sign that. Yeah. So we just talked about Tim being an aggressive lawyer. Doesn't sound very aggressive to me. No. I mean, he just. He was just completely he uh, believed in Jim Jones. Yeah, emasculated. Yeah, but we'll see by the end of this episode. This whole power play on for John Victor is going to backfire big time on on Jim Jones. Teaser. So, and then going back to Marceline, this was the last. This was kind of like the last straw for her with this whole signing this affidavit as a witness. She had met a psychiatrist at this time. But she was debating on on getting divorced from Jim. She was pretty much set at this point that she was going to get a divorce from him because she was just sick of all this bullshit. One of the smartest ones in the bunch, really. Yeah. She told him that she was leaving him, and he started the whole God's wrath shit with her, saying, like, you know, this army of death will come down on you, like all this bullshit. And she's like, Jim, you're an atheist. <laughs> but she knew. I mean, she already knew yeah. all this bullshit. So. I forgot that he was the atheist. Yeah. The so episode. she, I mean, she had been over all of this stuff. I mean, this is years yeah. going on. So Jim brought in the kids and said, your mother's trying to leave me. You know, do you want to go with her or stay with me? And they kind of were like, well, kind of want to go with our mom. And then he just cut the the whole God stick on stuff, and he was just like, "I'll fucking kill you <laughs> if you leave me. I'll fucking kill you." And she he doesn't do well with rejection. No. <laughs> <laughs> and she knew that that was something to take serious because at this time he's he had slowly started getting bodyguards around him that were armed at all times, and they were like deathly loyal to him. So she knew that this was something to take serious. You know right. that 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 could be a, a reality. So. Marceline just she was just she was just stuck yeah and just crazy tried her best the rest of the way to avoid things right the kids were fairly happy except for Stephen has some issues but they all recounted having good times as kids you know and they even had their own chimp named Mr. Muggs <laughs> and he he would be uh was he one of the spider monkeys no he was a chimp Sure, you just said that. <laughs> <laughs> he was kind. Of, he, he kind of became the mascot for the People's Temple, and he was one of the first, uh, the first residents at Jonestown. Mister Muggs. When they went down there to build it with twelve guys, they took Mister Muggs with them. It's a pioneer. Yeah. Um, but even with Mister Muggs, this was Jim always had to figure out a way to fucking make himself look better and and be the hero because the story was was that Jim had saved Mister Muggs from a. A laboratory that was doing testing on him but in reality he just fucking bought him from a pet store <laughs> he lies about everything yeah, like every know. little thing but he also he he would take the kids on vacations but i mean in this strict communal society you know he can't just tell his followers that so he would tell them that they were going on secret missions that had to do with the cause <laughs> <laughs> to the caribbean yeah on a beach. right <laughs> Uh, and then, like I said before, Stephen had some issues. He's their um, their biological son. He had tried to commit suicide three times when he was twelve. He said in an interview, it was just like a cry for help kind of thing. That's what he says now that he's an adult. Right, three times by the time you're twelve. That's so young. Yeah, he was he was taking a bunch of Jim's pills because mm. Jim would leave them out in the open, and it didn't seem like he really gave a shit that he tried to kill himself because he still left them right out in the open and accessible. 
in the early 70s, Jim started to move even farther away from preaching about God and started to replace himself with God. That's like the clip that I played in the intro with the whole sky God thing. Yeah. That was something he would say all the time. Is the sky God. What's the sky God ever done for you kind mm-hmm. of thing. Um, He's not wrong. Yeah. If I think it's just... just go it, ahead. It gets weird when you insert yourself yeah. as you're the... You're better than the sky God and you're doing all the things. Yeah. Um, but he he would start throwing Bibles across the room and jump up and down on them and get the band to start playing and he'd start dancing on the Bibles and shit. And he would start saying, you know, if the sky God's real, he would strike me down right now. And But it, it was subtle because he, he didn't just like get those people from the revival circuit in there and then just start fucking throwing a Bible around. Like he would pull out contradictions in it and be like, well, it says this and this part of the Bible, this here. And people would start thinking like, oh, yeah, that's kind of yeah. that sounds weird. You know, like, why is it contradict itself? And then eventually he built it to where. Which I understand that. You're pulling pulling out contradictions. Yeah. But then how these people go, oh, well, that's fake, but you're the real God. That's that's where I lose it a little bit. I think it's the community aspect of it. I mean, he already has the black community locked in with how much he's been able to help them out. And I think other people are, he's pulling out those contradictions and other people are seeing what he's done already. It's incremental. I mean, yeah. you've seen the revival tents, the chicken guts, and the cure and the cancer, and mm. this and that. So this is, you know, just I one so. step closer. Yeah. It's not that much crazier than what happened before. So after seven years of growing the People's Temple and becoming manipulative, manipulative enough to flip the beliefs of these hardcore Christians coming from the revival circuit. I've been trying to do that for years. I'm not <laughs> able to do that. Well, you know Jim Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Jim finally was ready to act on his plan to take over Mother Divine's international peace movement. <laughs> so this was, so Father Divine had passed away? Yeah. At this point? Mm-hmm. Well, he'd, Father he'd been Div- waiting out that life. Father Divine had passed away a few years before this even, and Jim, he, he, he knew what he was doing, you know? He was like that long game kind of thing. He was like... Well, he's dead, but I'm not exactly ready yet. You to, know? to announce that he transferred his body into me, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's yeah, a refresher. Mother Divine died. She was an old black woman, and then her body jumped into a 21 year old white woman named. Then she was called Sweet Angel Divine, right? And, and we no one that on the first. Yeah. One. Well, wait a minute. Aren't we going to see Mother Divine in Philly? Is that a, a Mother Divine part two? No, that's the 21 year old white girl. She eventually started went from. Sweet Angel Divine to oh. took over actual Mother Divine. I, it's, okay. It's, it's Very confusing. Names, oh. yeah. So Mother Divine is Sweet Angel. Yeah, yeah. That's the, the white girl. She mm-hmm. took She's over heading it all up at this point. Mm-hmm. Sweet Angel became the new Mother That's Divine. Right. Yeah. She's, yeah, she's running it now. So Jim took about 200 of his most loyal followers out to Philadelphia in those Greyhound buses. He was bold enough that he brought a few empty buses with him because he was so convinced of the shit that he was going to bring all these people back to California with him. He's an egomaniac. Yeah. So when he showed up, obviously they weren't buying it. And, and Jim wasn't giving anybody problems. You know, it was kind of, it was peaceful, but they weren't, they weren't buying the whole body jumping thing, you know? You don't say. And I, I picture it like, uh, like a game of chicken, like Mother Divine and Jim looking at each other. Like, we both know we're full of shit. Who's going to budge first on this? That's, that's a good point. Because <laughs> you know they're full of more shit. You're right. Meanwhile, both their believers and followers are ready to die for their cause, right. standing well, behind them. And because she, she's claiming to be the old lady Mother Divine, and he's claiming to be. Papa, Father Divine, right? right? So I mean, it's both full of shit. And right. the original ones might have been full of shit for all we know. Which ones? The the original Father Divine. What was his backstory again? Was he just religious? He was just was running he, a cult. Yeah. Just, oh, run, just, no, just running a cult. <laughs> no big deal. It reminds me of, uh, 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 remember Big Trouble in Little China? Mm-hmm. When, when Jack Burton's driving the semi in the alley and then those two gangs meet up. Like at that funeral, and they're just right. staring at each other, and it's like, duh, duh. <laughs> and it's just showing them, like, I'll stand there with their weapon. Have you seen that movie, Mm-mm. Big Trouble? It's so good. One of Kurt Russell's best. <laughs> but they're all just standing there, like, looking, just about ready to do death, uh, have battle to the death. That's what I kind of <laughs> picture now that you brought that up. They're all just staring at each other. Who's more fucked up, and who's going to win this? They're like, who's going to be the first one to cave in on right. them? They're yeah. full of shit. Right. So, but I mean, they weren't, they weren't buying it at all. So Jim got pissed. 
And he started yelling at their congregation, telling them that they weren't living uh, truly socialist lives. And since he was Father Divine now, if they didn't come to People's Temple, they were all going to hell. And <laughs> Mother Divine is just basically, like, get the fuck out of here and, and don't come back. Who'd have thought Sweet Angel, the voice of reason in all of this? <laughs> <laughs> he could never admit, you know, he couldn't admit to his followers that like, hey, she told me to get the fuck out of here in a private conversation and... And we're, you know, that's why we're heading back. He said, um, he said in a private conversation that she pulled open her shirt and showed him her, quote, sagging breasts (laughs) and Jim wouldn't fuck her. Which is a lie right there because Jim never met a woman he wouldn't fuck. (laughs) Well, hey, the fuck schedule was full. He was out of town. Yeah. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, walk-in hours. (laughs) But the, this is... It's a complete contradiction because when he was in Brazil, he fucked that woman for $5,000 for the orphanage. Very true. But he wouldn't fuck Mother Divine to gain all these followers. Wouldn't gaining all the followers be a bigger... uh... But Mother Divine publicly like humiliated him. So he can take that into a win by saying, well, yeah, but I turned her down after her sexual advances on me. He's a complicated mm-hmm. man. Yeah. Whereas the Brazil story, no one even knows about because wasn't he by himself at that point? But he told it all the time. But the the fact that he, he was unsuccessful there, uh, no one ever heard of, correct? No, yeah. He just came back and said, here's what I did. Right. This one, okay. people saw him get shut down by her. So he had to turn it into, well, she came on to me, but I refuted yeah. her. Mm. So I'm the hero. Yeah, that makes That's sense. That's how I yeah. took it. Sagging breasts. We had saggy baggy eye in episode one. <laughs> now I got old sagging breasts in episode whatever, 16, 17. Ugly Eskimo, he was called as a kid. Oh, yeah. That's Jim. right. Ugly Eskimo. And screen door intruder. Let's not forget the best <laughs> one. And it, it's just crazy throughout all this stuff. It's like everything just makes people stronger and stronger towards each other and and just loving Jim Jones more and they started growing a lot but I think it's like these little failures here and there caused him to realize that he needed to gain more control and so he started the planning commission and Jim sold this as the group was his most trusted followers and they were going to be planning out things for the People's Temple. But really, it was just like a testing ground for him to see what he could get away with before putting it out to the to the larger Put it population. To the most trusted people before doing it to the rest of them. Yeah. And like I said, he would bring like those like the guy we talked about earlier that brought the shit up about Russia. He would bring those type of people into the planning commission because he was like, I the educated I, people. Yeah, he was like, I need like if someone was like talking shit and, you know, you'd be like, all right, you come in here with me. You're you, you're important. You need to be in here. You can't be out there talking to everybody else, basically. Right. Make well, and, them feel more important. Yeah. And if I can get this over on this group, then I can get it over on everybody. Right. I'll. The dummies out there, yeah, as yeah. opposed to the smart ones in here. But basically, too, this this turned into like his personal, like I don't know, fucking like dating service or something. Where he would just bring in all these women <laughs> that he wanted to fuck. See, it all just goes back to him fucking people. Oh yeah, they say he would just talk about all the women he's fucked, and sometimes they would be in the room with him, like, and he would just be talking about fucking them, and he would have them write up like essays about. <laughs> like, <laughs> How good it was to fuck Jim Jones and read it out loud to people. Do we have these letters so Mike can read them? <laughs> no. Oh, I would have read that in a voice, too. <laughs> I would have done a sensual voice for that one. <laughs> the planning commission takes a dark turn with... Um, they came. They started coming up with punishments to put out to the rest of the congregation for people that were being hostile. And the, the punishments started out with like what we were talking about with Whitey Firestone just getting screamed at in front of everybody and told how big of a piece of shit you were and then that was from the first episode yeah um he's the guy that drove his car over a cliff right yeah that's right yeah um available now on all of <laughs> forms of uh when you can listen to ipod or i <laughs> fuck <laughs> where you can listen to all forms of podcasts on apple uh podcasts <laughs> itunes youtube spotify stitcher google play what else are we on i can't remember them all. Cast something. Cast box. Tune in. Tune in. Tune in is the new one. Well, and again, this is episode two. If you haven't listened to the first episode, I told you to get the fuck out of here at the beginning of the episode. <laughs> so so if you, you're still here. You weren't listening. It's all on you. <laughs> so go back and listen so I don't have to struggle through that all that again. 
So it was very difficult to say. So they introduced um, they introduced spankings that just started out with a couple hits from a belt. And keep in mind, this is all in front of a congregation of hundreds of people. So you're getting. Do you think he was he only spanked the women? He didn't do any of this. This was he would instruct other people from the planning commission to do this shit. He never did anything the planning himself. Commission. <laughs> How many people are on the planning commission? Like a hundred, maybe a little more. <laughs> How many people in, in total in the congregation at this point? Any idea? Several By 73, hundred, right? it was like 3,000. Wow. By the height of it, it was like pushing 7,000. Wow. And that's um, what we're going to build to here in a little while, right? Yeah. Then they ditched the belt and they started using a paddle. And that was just one or two hits. And then it went up to like 25 and 50. Then it like pushed 100. And it just, you know, progressively got more ridiculous. And then they brought in forced fights which a member was forced to fight another member that they had no chance of winning against. And if they did have like a bigger guy or bigger, yeah, or like a gonna... woman against a fucking like teenage boy. Oh um, God. And if they did win, then they would just have to fight someone else until they lost. Do you think they killed that teenage boy if, when he lost to like a woman <laughs> or when they killed like the one, like the, if the underdog beat you, were you, forced into some punishment well you probably had to go to the back of the line They're like well now you're on this side of the line now you're gonna get your no, ass yeah, kicked. <laughs> you're on that side now we're gonna put you against some big 300 pound brute <laughs> sounds great but you know these these punishments were for doing small stuff i mean this was just this would be like sitting there saying that bitching about that you had peanut butter sandwiches for a week straight you wanted some different kind of food this was not like this wasn't a, a big shit going on here mm. Real crimes, they help, they handled them in house, which is never a good idea for Real any group. crimes like messing up the fuck schedule or something. Like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean things showing up at your unappointed. Time. Well, we're talking about serious things now. Yeah. So. <laughs> so an example of this is they had um they had brought in a, a pedophile that they thought that they could fix. And spoiler alert, that didn't work out. <laughs> so instead of turning this guy into the police. They, they had turned him, him into a eunuch. <laughs> they, they made him drop his pants and put his his uh, his genitals on a table and just beat him with a rubber hose until they were like unrecognizable. <laughs> oh, my <God. laughs> oh my god! And you, it's true because you in the in Guyana. We're gonna play some clips from Guyana in part three, but there's a guy in Guyana that tried to rape a twelve year old girl in. Jim says, drop your pants, and then they're, like, punching him in the balls and stuff. <laughs> and then uh, and then he's like, yeah, turn around, look at everybody. They're all swollen now. He's like, you should have seen what we did to the guy back in the States. So, I mean, he acknowledges that they did the this to this guy. guy. Yeah, because yeah, oh Jim's gosh. like, you should be thankful we didn't do what oh. we did to that guy. You got a picture of this guy's balls we could post? No. I'm kidding. I'm not posting that shit. <laughs> so, you know, he's he's got the planning commission going. Well, hang on. What happened to that yeah. guy? Like, his... Uh... I, like I, permanently unrecognizable. I don't know. I know they they had to. I know it said they had to take him to the hospital, and I wonder like how he would get around because usually hospitals are like if there's a sign of like assault or something, they sure. like question it. I wonder how he got around like saying that someone it was just, sexual gratification. <laughs> someone didn't just beat the fuck out of his balls. That's a bad Thai food. I don't know what I like. That's a bad Thai food. <laughs> I let a woman with high heels on just stomp all over my balls and <laughs> for 20 minutes. How do you get your rocks off, Doc? <laughs> Don't judge me. But yeah, so with the planning commission, you know, he had more control than ever. So he figured it was time to time, time to try and get that political power that he had always wanted and, and set his eyes on San Francisco. And when he when he showed up to San Francisco, he had his mother start going to a doctor named Carlton Goodlip. Carlton Goodlett ran a very influential black newspaper in San Francisco. So Jim would go to these appointments with his mother and like play the good son, like, um, you know, taking his mom to the yeah, doctor. Yeah, just helping out, being good boy. And then after, after a while ago into these doctor's appointments, he would start telling uh, Carlton Goodlett about the People's Temple and all the good work they're doing. And, and eventually the doctor's like, yeah, sounds like you're doing good stuff, but I want to try and get you into San Francisco. So he got Jim in starting to do uh, guest sermons at black churches and he he bought he bought the building and just like completely under under their nose it just started siphoning off members 
from these black churches to the people's temple. Hmm. I'm always shocked when, you know, educated people fall for this kind of stuff. Yeah, but I mean... I guess on the outside, though, it looked like he was legitimately doing all these good works, right? I mean, you think from this doctor's perspective, doesn't even know Jim Jones. This guy's already running a, a black newspaper with, you know, doing civil rights stuff. And then here you got this guy, and he's like, well, here's all the shit I've done with civil yeah. rights and all the right. shit he did in Indianapolis. So he's probably like, yeah, hey, let's get this guy in here. Yeah. That's what I struggle with, too. Like, going through this, we're hearing all this piece of shit stuff he's doing. But a lot of this is kept inside, internal. People don't know. So from the outside, you're seeing some of the successes he has. And again, he's a, he's a well-spoken, charismatic guy who can probably win you over with with what he's saying. Um, and as we'll get to probably later, you know, we're going to get to later, he's convincing very powerful people that he's a good person and, yeah. and that his cause is, is quote, legit. So it's, from the outside, it does look legit, you know? And, right. But then as, you're, as we're <clears throat> what, look, going through the story, it's like, how are these people so fucking dumb? Well, stuff just takes it's look at Scientology. I mean, that's the most ridiculous thing in the world, and it's 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 huge. Great, now I we think, got them coming after <laughs> us. I think it's it's the it's it's all subtle, and I think it's like people. You know, you can see any interviews with people, former members of the People's Temple. They're like, you know, this started out great, and by a, a couple years, you're like, wait, what the fuck happened? Like, where did this take this turn? Now all of a sudden, yeah. everybody's we're having boxing matches, forced boxing matches and shit. Like, what the fuck happened? <laughs> but now I'm scared to leave. Yeah. So to summarize what Dave said, fuck Scientology. I mean, th- it was <laughs> like a, a bad science fiction writer. And now it's this huge religion that owns all this, you know. That's an episode. Real estate all do. over the world. Their, I want their attention. It's insane. I want their attention so that we can blow up. It's 100% nonsense. That's that's one I'm excited to do. Don't should, I, yeah. should I ask you about flat earthers now? <laughs> it's 200 percent nonsense i'm not even gonna entertain that we'll just that'll be a bonus episode dave just rants about both of those we'll, yeah, we'll give them some blantons we'll give them some miller lights and we'll just let them sit there for two hours and he just drink and rant and just pontificate all, all night it'll be like kiss we'll do our solo pod solo album yeah solo and then we'll podcast. see who gets the most downloads like kiss <laughs> Well, I would I would talk about ninety eight degrees and Backstreet Boys the whole time. So the Teen Girls would would love my episode. Yeah, you'll have ten downloads. You'll be doing great. <laughs> teen Girls from like from back the, then. So like people <laughs> our age probably because yeah nowadays they they what, who do they love now? I don't even know. Justin Bieber still is he still a thing? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not a teen girl. I'm gonna answer like I did earlier. I have no fucking idea what you're talking about. So because he had all these new followers that weren't there for the the first fake assassination attempt where he shot just shot at his house then ran back inside he uh he had to give all these people the feeling of that there was an enemy out there so they were doing a um makes you more legitimate when there's an enemy yeah in redwood valley they were having a cookout outside before uh one of the sermons and jim started walking through the parking lot and there's like a good hundred people or so and all of a sudden, just gunshots started ringing out, and Jim fell to the ground, holding his chest, and you know, he had like <laughs> blood, blood soaking his shirt. And um, a, a very close follower named Jack Beam, who was in on it, hurried Jim inside. So everyone's out outside, freaking out, thinking Jim's dead. You know, everyone's like, you know, crying and and whatever. And then, uh, and then Jim miraculously walked out. Walk back out. Amazing. Fine. He healed himself he this healed. time. Yeah. They got like special effects going on out here. It's <laughs> like Tom Savini working on Jim Jones. Yeah, we're, exploding blood packs. <laughs> Probably I, wasn't ketchup at all. <laughs> and I, I think this was, wasn't was as much to... I, I think it did a couple things. I think it was just to keep everybody off, off guard because everyone was happy at this time. So it was like throw some fear in there. But I think it was also a big excuse to get him to boost that that armed security team he had around him because after this they got they got real fucking scary they started wearing uniforms with like the beret hats and shit and following him around constantly so really? it, yeah they got real intense after this well and he also preys off fear so yeah. if everything's hunky dory that's not good for him he needs people to be afraid that he might die or that people are to get him because his message is on point and well that's always changes yeah yeah, yeah. yeah and they actually because he was wearing a, a yellow button-up shirt, so the blood, you know, got even more of that effect. And they even framed it 
and hung it in the in the temple for a oh, while. Naturally. Yeah, but then the police got word of like what happened. They wanted to come investigate, so they took the took the shirt down, <laughs> put that put that away. Oh real shit! Quick. Put this away. <laughs> He's gonna smell that ketchup. Ridiculous. <laughs> Word had started getting around San Francisco about this this assassination attempt, so he got even more followers from this. Everything started, you know, all this talk and all this stuff caught the caught the attention of a local reporter named Lester Kinsolving. By the time Lester was done investigating Jim Jones, he had enough to spread the story over an eight day series, so it would go a new thing would come out each day. But because he Jim had Tim Stone on his side. Tim was able to, uh, you know, he was super aggressive. The um, the article only ran for four days before Tim got the San, Fr- San Francisco examiner to pull it. Wow. Hmm. Friends in a high place. And all it got out was that it was probably, it didn't really have anything damning in it. It was just like, it's probably a scam. There's probably fake healings. Like there wasn't any like concrete proof. Um, and the stuff that we know of. From yeah. The and the parts. stuff about. The punishments that were included in it came from Whitey Firestone after he defected, but none of that was ever published. So again, I you know feel bad for Whitey. He drove off a fucking cliff. He's getting screamed <laughs> down, and then the shit that he tries to expose doesn't it doesn't work. The one there. person who's mm. trying to actually put a stop to all this shit. But so these articles, even though they didn't really do anything damaging, it, it just grew everybody strong like together more because now instead of like this faceless fake assassin shit he had a real enemy he's like look they're trying to they're putting stuff in the newspapers and trying to uh take us down and make us not accomplish all the stuff that we're trying to do we must be doing something right gang yeah yeah Yeah. and i mean there even a local reporter from san francisco thought his name was mike prokes he thought that there might be something to it so he went down to Redwood Valley to see if he could get a story out of it. And then he ended up joining the People's Temple and became their press secretary. <laughs> How does that happen? <laughs> it's it's crazy. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Mike, maybe Jim Jones was also hypnotizing people. Well, there's something to that. I mean, at this point, I would believe that <laughs> as to why these people are falling for it so easily. Yeah. So as as the stuff as things were continuing to grow rapid more rapidly, Jim Jones was about to be hit with a defection that would force him to handle rejection completely different for the first time, and they were called the Gang of Eight. We'll be right back. We like to drink beer, a lot of it. After a long night of drinking and talking crime and conspiracies, there's nothing that wakes us up and gets us ready to start the day better than just brew coffee. With a great selection of roast levels to choose from, you're guaranteed to find one that suits your style. Small batch roasted to highlight the unique features of each coffee bean. Just Brew Coffee caters to both casual and hardcore coffee drinkers alike. Since 2010, Just Brew Coffee has worked tirelessly to perfect the roasting process and technique, which has resulted in seriously delicious, always flavorful, and never bitter tasting coffee. If you're already drinking JBC, raise your mug. If you're not, raise your standards. Check them out in social media and remember, they roast, you just brew. Check out their new online store at youjustbrew.com and up your coffee game today. Use code NECRO15 to receive 15% off your order of two pounds or more. So the Gang of Eight was a group of eight students who were going to college paid for by the People's Temple. Uh, They consisted of young people that were from prominent families in the People's Temple. Basically just families that gave money. And they had everything taken care of of with school and paid for. Yeah. Well, it was nice of Jim. But the problem. He's a giving guy. (laughs) <laughs> Mostly with his cock. <laughs> <laughs> the problem with them, though, is they were able to get out into the real world and actually see stuff, you know, and see how things ran. And they, you know, they started to see through Jim's bullshit. Yeah, that's what normally happens. Right. And even though Jim was preaching the racial equality stuff and doing great stuff, his real inner circle was all white, except for one black guy named Archie Imus. They started kind of putting two and two together with some of this shit. And they started to hear about the planning commission meetings with all the sex and humiliation stuff. So they wrote up a manifesto and sent it to the People's Temple. So this this next quote makes sense. Um, Jim started to claim that he was the only heterosexual person in the entire world. And everyone else was homosexual. Wait, the world or the people's temple? <laughs> the world. <laughs> and everyone the else. The world is gay except Jim Jones. Yeah. 
I have that tattooed actually on my ankle. (laughs) And the planning commission also had started to come up with ways to incriminate people trying to leave or if they did leave the people's temple. So here's that quote. All the planning commission does (laughs) is call each other homosexuals, (laughs) asking each other if they suck cocks and try to plant dope on people. What a contribution to socialism. (laughs) I mean, it gets the point across, I guess. I don't think those college students were happy with the people's temple. (laughs) They weren't. Disenfranchised. I I imagine that's how they wrote that, feeling that inside. Did a good job. (laughs) They're like, these are the assholes that are sending us to school. What's wrong with my fucking parents? All they do is suck cocks and try to plant dope on people. (laughs) It's a bold statement. Mm -hmm. But because these were kids from prominent families that were important to the People's Temple because they gave a lot of money and they were from these high up families in the... You can't go after them. Right. So he he told everybody in the congregation that they had to forgive the kids. They couldn't scream at them and berate them and shit when they came back and... Like he did to other other family or other people that defected. You know, anybody else that defected was immediately like the number one enemy mm. and stuff. But the kids did not come back. Were the parents kept from seeing the kids like they did in Scientology if you left? And, you know, and I'm not sure. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, I just know. Yeah, they didn't come back. They well, they were pretty emph- uh, emphatic with that statement. That you know, making it very cocks. clear they're not <laughs> they're not okay with this. And pretty smart not to come back. Yep. But uh, but Jim Jim learned a lesson with that that all that stuff that was going on in the planning commission was supposed to be kept secret. So like I said before, he the, he was trying to do this stuff with incriminating people. So Jim made everybody in the planning commission sign blank statements that could be filled in with whatever he came up with. <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> like this again. How do people sign this stuff? Like why why? I, I don't know. Can you guys sign me a blank check for in case I just need to fill it in later? <laughs> just in case just you in ever case. need to. Yeah, yeah of course. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, in that in that um that jungle of terror documentary I was watching last night, they were saying the one lady that had was a part of the planning commission and had been in the People's Temple for years said that they were had to sign statements that they were planning on assassinating the president, like all this nonsense. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. Um but I mean, it didn't make. I mean, legally, you couldn't hold that. Wouldn't hold up if you like signed a thing that said I beat my wife, signed by whoever. Yeah, you know, sure. But if he showed the congregation, they'd one hundred percent believe right. that shit. And I know there's another one. There was another story of a woman that wanted to leave, and before she left, Jim made her hold a a handgun and then put it in a plastic bag so it had her oh, fingerprints on it. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, they, 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 he was kicking it up. That the gang of eight really made him kick up that the defection thing. Yeah, well, he wanted to have something on everyone so yeah. he could hold it over them. Instead, these guys, he paid for their education. They got smart and realized they were this Jonestown was not good. He was a piece of shit. Right. They got the fuck out of there. Called him a cocksucker along the way. <laughs> <laughs> Wonder where the gang of eight is now. Um, what, what are they up to? The White mm-hmm. House. The White House. <laughs> So to keep keep the fear going, he backtracked on Russia like we talked about before. So now he started to make the U.S. government be the be the thing to fear, and he started uh, he started preaching that all black people and minorities were going to be put in concentration camps and be killed. So well, he's going back again to playing up the 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 racial tensions and, and yeah. going back to that well and. No longer is Russia the enemy, it's the U.S. government. Right. Um, well, and the U.S. government has never put citizens in concentration camps, so that's just ridiculous. Ever. Period. End of discussion. <laughs> we shouldn't even disgrace our Reservations, about concentration that. camps, yeah. nothing <laughs> the of the sort. The Trail of Tears never even happened. I don't know why you even bring that up, Dave. <laughs> but so making the U.S. government the, the enemy now, who's able to sell the idea of leaving for Jonestown? Which at that time he called the promised land. It was not Jonestown yet. No, and but that's a that's a thing too. And I, I think he knew exactly what he was doing, calling it the promised land, because he's got a majority black congregation. The promised land, something that goes back to like slave days, you know, with them talking about, well, we got the promised land. The promised land's coming up, you know. That's something that's always been in black churches. It's a keyword. Yeah. So I think he just 
I think that was the best way for him to be able to sell that idea. So that same year in uh, 1973, Jim started scouting out where he could establish Jonestown. And before he could even get it all going, he almost took the whole thing down by getting arrested for lewd conduct in Los Angeles. Jim went to the Westlake Theater, which was known to be a place where gay guys could go and have like no strings attached sex. And the Westlake Theater was trying to crack down on it. So they had undercover cops sometimes come in and try and bust people. While uh, while Jim was watching Dirty Harry, he gave some guy the foot tap. <laughs> I love Dirty Harry. I watched that not too long ago. <laughs> and, uh, and headed to the bathroom. And when the guy came in, he was an undercover cop. Jim already had his dick out and was masturbating ready to go. <laughs> And so there's no time for gaps in the fuck schedule. <laughs> he was immediately arrested. <laughs> but my thing is, is like, you've got the fuck schedule. Why are you going to try and like his? Yeah, he has this whole congregation. Well, that he can bang it. Well, it's maybe the, I would imagine after so many years of having this fuck schedule, you want that thrill of picking up someone outside, someone random, yeah, all right. someone, you know, in a theater where it's mm-hmm. not supposed to have it happen. I would imagine having them brought to you on a silver platter all the time might get a little boring. Yeah, I don't know. The thrill of the hunt. I mean, room service is only good for so long. Sometimes you want to go out to eat, right? (laughs) 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 Just saying. You want to change up the mechanism of the delivery. Well, I'm sure he's probably getting bored at this point. He wants something else. He wants something exciting. So go watch, I guess, Dirty Harry, give the old foot tap, and jerk off in a bathroom like every good blooded, red blooded American. <laughs> All right. What happens next? <laughs> he went in front of the judge and he came with a note from a urologist that said that he had a, a, a swollen prostate and he was just jumping up and down to ease it. <laughs> seems, <laughs> seems legit. <laughs> Uh, but Tim Stone being so high up and just this <laughs> awesome lawyer, he was able to get the whole thing dismissed and hmm. completely covered it up. Didn't come out until after after the Jonestown, after the massacre and everything. This, not, this was old Mr. Prostate the issue was jerking yeah. off in a bathroom. Yeah. So go enjoy Dirty Harry, Dave. <laughs> Give the old foot tap next time you watch it. Man's got to know his limitations. <laughs> Um, so after he got that this whole thing settled, he, he started focusing on Guyana. And the People's Temple was just what Guyana needed. And like we said in part one, they had just gotten their independence. And because of that, they no longer had any military backing. I think at the time they said it was like just a couple, like like a thousand guys. Not, it wasn't very much at all. The and military. They, their military, the Guyanese military. Mm. It was all young guys that didn't know anything about being in the military. They just, to you know get out of poverty or whatever, just sure. joined up. Hmm. But just north of them is Venezuela, and they had been in a, a border dispute with Guyana for years. So Guyana was more than happy to give Jim Jones the land on the border almost immediately because they knew that Venezuela wouldn't try and fuck with them if there was a bunch of Americans living right in the middle. They, you know, they wouldn't right. risk doing anything mm. like that. So they basically just just handed it right over to to Jim Jones. There was like no questions asked. And then so 12 people's temple members and Mr. Muggs went down to start work on Jonestown. Was Mr. Muggs the foreman? That's, what, like, what that's was my he favorite doing? page of all these notes. Mr. Muggs. 12 people's temple members and Mr. Muggs started work on Jonestown. Yeah. We'll see you next week. <laughs> We'll post a picture of Mr. Muggs down there. We will absolutely out. post a picture of Mr. Muggs. There's some good pictures of him <laughs> hanging out in Jonestown. We no, might have no already. Doubt. I don't know. I might have used that as my teaser pick for this week. Mr. Muggs. If you already have seen Mr. Muggs, then then that's why. <laughs> Mr. fucking Muggs. <laughs> so, I mean, and Jim's got, he's got all, everything's going, going right for him at this point. You know, he's got Jonestown finally going. That was real fucking easy to to get that land. Probably way easier than it should be just to go lease land from a yeah. foreign country. Right. Yeah, well, probably a little bit. <laughs> so he finally started pulling for that political power. In 1975, George Moscone was in a tight race for, um, for ma- the mayor of San Francisco. And Moscone knew that he needed the black vote to win. And Jim Jones was, was the guy to get it for him. So the People's Temple ended up winning the election for Moscone. 
in return, he made Jim the chairman of the San Francisco the San Francisco Housing Authority Commission. Are you sure it's the Housing Authority Commission? Do you have a retraction statement you'd like to make at this <laughs> yeah, time? Yeah, I, I said he was in Indiana. He was what was he? Uh, you tell us, man. Your ass got called out. I know. <laughs> That's, uh, Apparently, dare. you still have not learned your lesson. <laughs> How dare I misspeak? Mm. <laughs> it was our friend Natalie Owens on Instagram, who's also a Jonestown expert, uh, pointed out that mistake you had made with regards to... Yeah, I said he was part of the Housing Commission in Indiana. And he, in fact, was not. Dun, 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 dun. Fake podcast news. <laughs> <laughs> he was not the housing director in Indy. He was actually human rights commissioner. Yeah, okay. It was later in San Francisco that Mas- Moscone, Moscone mm. appointed him housing authority chair, which Jim Jones saw as an insult. Mm. Yeah. He was not thrilled with that position. Thank you to uh, Natalie for clearing that up for us. Ian apologizes for his error. First time he's ever made an error on this show for the record. <laughs> Let the record show that. <laughs> Yeah, he did. He did see that as an insult. He expected something more out of that. But Moscone got him in with uh, Walter Mondale during his campaign before 1976. And Mondale publicly praised the People's Temple for everything that they were doing. First Lady Rosalind Carter had also met with Jim on multiple occasions and spoke with him over the phone about Cuba and while she was First Lady. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and publicly spoke with him at the. at the grand opening of the People's Temple, San Francisco headquarters, and Jim got a louder applause than she did. Over the First Lady of the United States of America. Uh, Quick fun fact about Walter Mondale. He ran uh, for president in 1984 against um, Ronald Reagan. And only won Minnesota. And only won Minnesota. Lost 49 states. He ran with Geraldine Ferraro, who was a female. Well, Walter Mondale's nickname was Fritz. So the Reagan campaign or the Republicans nicknamed them Fritz and Tits. And that was what they had dubbed them for that campaign in 1984. Probably the biggest blowout uh, in presidential election history. Sounds like it. No matter what maybe the current president has said, this is the actual biggest (laughs) blowout. 1984, Mondale, I think. Did he actually just win one state? He won Minnesota. And that was it. And that was it. Yeah. I wasn't alive, Dave. Sorry. <laughs> Son of a bitch. You weren't alive, were you? I was not. Motherfucker. 84. You were not either, No, I wasn't either. <laughs> we were alive for the next one in 88. Yeah. I was alive for a Reagan presidency. <laughs> Only two years of it. Rat fucks. Any hoodles. Yeah, so in September 1977, California Assemblyman Willie Brown served as Master of Ceremonies at a uh, a large testimonial dinner for Jim, and was attended by Governor Jerry Brown and uh, Lieutenant Governor Mervyn Damali. At that dinner, Brown said that Jim was an example of what you should see every day when you look in the mirror. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> sunglasses looking back at you. <laughs> And said that he was a combination of Martin Luther King Jr., Angela Davis, Albert Einstein, and and Mao Zedong. And Joseph Mengele, this fucking guy. It's unbelievable (laughs) that this is the stuff that politicians are saying about him. Because that's what he's promoting to the rest of the world. The world sees him as a great civil rights person. And I know, I keep telling myself we're looking back and hearing all of the inside scoop after the fact. People didn't know at the time. Yeah, like if he could have just filtered down the crazy. Yeah. Like he would have been a big, you know. Yeah. Could have had President Jim Jones. Can you imagine? Yeah. (laughs) I can. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And Harvey Milk spoke at one of their political rallies that was held at the temple and then afterwards wrote Jim a letter. No, I've not seen that movie Milk, so I can't do it justice if I'm going to try to read like. uh, Like Harvey Milk. Who was the actor? Sean Penn. Sean Penn. Is it good? Is that movie good? I don't think I've ever seen that. No? I've never seen it. I thought it was like either. an Academy Award nominated movie. I thought you watch all those. I usually do. I right. don't recall well, watching it. Everyone should go watch Milk. I'm going to try to watch it before next week. Rev Jim, it may take me many a day to come back down from the high that I reached today. I found something dear today. I found a sense of being that makes up for all the hours and energy placed in a fight. I found what you wanted me to find. I shall be back. For I can never leave. Yikes. Signed, Vitamin D. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) 
thought that was Harvey Milk's nickname. <laughs> Vitamin D. I don't know. <laughs> Some poor milk joke. <laughs> it was a poor milk joke. Vitamin D. But yeah, I mean, the People's Temple had Angela Davis, Huey Newton, all these major, you know, they had, and all the political people, but like Angela Davis and stuff, that's what who the People's Temple would resonate with, you know? Black Panthers. Yeah, so they yeah. see these people come into their services, and it's like, you know. He had everyone fooled. Yeah, I mean, it's like a huge thing, like, like we did it. All this time we've been busting ass and mm. doing all this stuff. And then, and then you got to think, too, the people in the planning commission that are seeing all this fucking ridiculous shit go on. It's like, well, we got to be doing something right, you know. I think you could rationalize it in that way. Mm. You know, something must be something must be going right because, you know, look at all this stuff we're accomplishing. You know, and then, like I said, you, the, the sense that we made it, and then on top of that, the fucking promised land's being built. With Mr. Muggs. Right. <laughs> and 12 other non-important people. <laughs> 12. I picture him with, like, a construction hat on and a clipboard, like, walking around with, like, a tie. Like, he's telling everyone, like, no, take this tree down, take this. Right, he was Getting the foreman. He had yeah. to be, right? Yeah. <laughs> fucking Mr. Muggs. He probably talked. <laughs> hey, fucker, wrong tree. <laughs> God damn it, you take lunch when I tell you you take lunch. We're not unionized. <laughs> but yeah, I mean that's like that's one of the the craziest things with which Jones sound like that you said if he could have just cut out the the crazy shit because no uh no cult leader or probably ever again would have that type of validation. Yeah, he was in with everyone. Yeah. It's just the whole absolute power corrupts thing and uh yeah. Yeah, it's not, it's, yeah, it's just fucking crazy. But then behind closed doors, the planning commission stuff was getting was getting real dark. In one meeting, Jim told the planning commission members that in Redwood Valley, they had made enough grapes for that year to afford a couple bottles of wine so they should celebrate. Because right off their property, there was a, a grape vineyard that they owned. Oh, nice. Uh, <clears throat> you don't hear of a lot of alcohol use. Was there a lot of alcohol use? Or None at all. He was just doing those drugs. Yeah, no pills, one. Yeah, he was the only one, and no one knew about it. Really? No one else yeah. was probably allowed to do any of that mm-hmm. stuff because that was yeah. more like personal they gratification. Were, yeah, yeah, they were all all sober. Hmm. Anything extra like that was called bourgeois, and that was not okay. No, that was an extreme insult. Like, if you did anything extra, you'd just be screamed at and told you were being bourgeois. So, but what about these extra bottles of wine, then? Well, he said it was all right. He allowed them to... Yeah, Jim said it was all right, so it's all right. All right. So, they all got got a glass of wine. He just walked around the room, and after he was satisfied that everybody had took a drink, he told them that it was poisoned, and they had 45 minutes to live. (laughs) So, So, Patty Cartmel, remember, she runs the fuck schedule... That's right. She was the fuck schedule yeah. coordinator. Because she was too ugly to be on the schedule herself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So she was in on it, and she freaked out and went running for the door. Mike Prokes, the guy that we said was the journalist who drove down there and ended up Press joining. Press secretary. Yep. He was also in on it and pulled out a pistol that was filled with blanks and shot it at Patty. <laughs> What is going on over there? (laughs) Yeah, that's what I said. It gets real fucking wild here. So Patty dropped to the floor and started faking like she was dying. And Jim said, if you don't accept death with dignity, everybody will be killed like Patty. This motherfucker. Yeah, I mean, and then people were, like, sitting there. I know um, Tim Carter, the one guy that survived Jonestown, he said people were, like, saying, like, I'm feeling, I feel something happening because you're, I think your mind just tricks you in a situation like that. Yeah, you know? I think that's, that's not uncommon. Right. But at the end, Jim told him it was just a test. So did they, when he said that it was a test, he also said, like, that shooting of Patty was fake, too, right? Yeah, I mean, like, you'd have he to. He didn't just, like, get rid of her then and was like, oh, no, I killed her because no. like that wasn't our scare tactic. Yeah. It was, it was, oh, she was in on it, but. It was a test like this could happen if you don't. Right. Yeah, me. exactly. Mike, the fuck schedule would be all jacked up if he got rid of <laughs> well, her. Well, by this point, he could have had John John running the fuck schedule. I don't know. Mr. Muggs could have been running. He's over there building, did the whole town. He can come back and run the fuck schedule, too. He's looking at uh, Jim Jones going, oh, you're going to add this to my plate, too? God damn. Just trying to take a banana break. <laughs> If it was today, he could have, you know, Google Docs and he could have ran the fuck schedule from Don and Guyana. Right? If only that existed. <laughs> if only. He, and then he actually did a, uh, like a post, a post test uh, poll 
asking everybody if they were like somewhat convinced, convinced <laughs> <laughs> on a scale of <laughs> not convinced to very convinced. How convinced were you? What do you guys think? Were you buying it? <laughs> this is, this is uh, anonymous. You don't have to sign your name. <laughs> It, it, the, the, the only real question he got out of it, like the only thing that anybody said was like, what would happen to all the kids we left behind? And and Jim said that to that question, Jim said that, that he had acquired a nuclear weapon that was parked in a van right around the corner and he would just blow up San Francisco if he needed to. <laughs> I don't understand how that helped the situation or answered the question. What's going to happen to our kids that we care for? Yeah. Well, I'll blow them up. <laughs> Like I know you view some of these people as victims, but Part this is ridiculous. Is very weird. Now they're just accepting that he would kill their kids. Is that what he's saying? I have a nuclear weapon in a van, and I'll just blow up San Francisco. <laughs> like if you don't get your kids and leave immediately, then you get what's coming to you. I don't disagree. Well, remember, and we talked about Carolyn Layton last episode that she was Jim's mistress and would become like his. She was like one. the ruthless one. Yeah. Yeah. That would do the things that Marceline wouldn't do. Right. Um, well, he was fucking her too, right? Carolyn? Yeah. Yeah. He's he's fucking everybody. He's fucking Mr. Muggs at this point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mr. Muggs is Friday, two o'clock. That's his fuck schedule. So it's very specific. <laughs> well, I'm privy to more information than you guys are. I got documents. <laughs> So at this time, Carolyn Layton had disappeared on a supposed secret mission to Mexico. And then when she came back, she had a baby. (laughs) (laughs) And the official story from Jim was that she had gone to Mexico to buy that nuke that he was going to use to blow everything up. Because Mexico, they were well ahead of all that. (laughs) But then she got all the good nukes down there. (laughs) But she got arrested and was raped in prison. Uh, uh, of course. So, but then they started using it against members. Like, if you said you didn't like what you were doing, they'd be like, well, you know what? Carolyn got raped. She got so. raped in a Mexican prison. <laughs> so who the fuck are you to complain about your peanut butter sandwich, exactly. you little bitch? <laughs> exactly. Mr. Muggs is down there running a, a new town. <laughs> and you're up here complaining about a peanut butter sandwich. <laughs> He's a talking chimp, for Christ's sake. Yeah, let's, let's also talk about that. He's a talking chimp. You're complaining about peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> but really what happened was that Jim just got her pregnant. Of course and, he did. <laughs> and she was just staying at her parents' house while just being comfortable having the baby. Which is good for her, I guess. I, I mean, if she's having a baby, great. Right. She should be comfortable. Um, but, I mean, she got off. She, Carolyn, by this time, had gotten over that, like, that awe aspect of Jim Jones and saw that Grace Stone was allowed to keep her baby and... And by this time, Carolyn had been made to get several abortions. And like you were saying, like how we said in part one, that she had the, I guess, like the quote guts to carry out some of this shit that, that Marceline didn't because Marceline is a good person. So Jim said, you know, allowed her to keep the baby to kind of just to make her happy. Mm-hmm. What a nice guy. Yeah. So giving. <laughs> because Jim, there was no chance of Jim divorcing Marceline. Like he couldn't publicly do that. Mike Prokes, that. The journalist who joined was forced into a fake marriage with Carolyn, and in 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 the, in the baby was named Jim John Prokes, and they Jim nicknamed him Chemo. It's like you think this is all just a made up nonsense story, yet it's all true. Yeah, I don't think we can make something this fucked up. I really don't think if we tried to make something this this crazy, we wouldn't come up with anything this good. Mm, yeah, no, it our, ours would feel too forced. And, and people continued to buy all this shit because as far as they knew, the promised land was going good in Guyana because Jim was going back and forth this at this time and coming back with proof like with, he had a picture of him with a ton of fruit that they had that they had grown in Jonestown. The only problem with that was was that the soil was was absolutely fucking terrible and they couldn't grow anything because it, it needed to t- it would take years to to like crop rotate all this uh-huh. stuff. So Jim in the capital, Georgetown, in Guyana, just went and bought a bunch of fruit and <laughs> posed for a picture with it. That's Look, all. when the government gives you free land they don't want, maybe do some soil testing samples before you move <laughs> everyone down there. Mr. Muggs could have told well, you Well, I think that. Mr. Muggs put in for a subsidy for it, but it was denied. <laughs> he wasn't approved of that funding. 
Yeah, so, I mean, he made it look like it was going really well down there, but in actuality, it was extremely slow. It started out with 12 people and Mr. Muggs, <laughs> <laughs> and then eventually... It's like a bad sitcom. <laughs> it's like Baker's Foreman's Dozen, Mr. Muggs, and 12 day laborers building a he compound. Is, without a doubt, the shining star yeah, of this. this is the best part of the story, Mr. Muggs. <laughs> Mr. Muggs holding a bullhorn, they're all working out in the field. I hope Mr. Muggs comes out of this scenario. He does not. <laughs> no! 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 Come on! No, Mr. Muggs was like the first one to die no! in Jonestown. No! Mr. Muggs doesn't like flavor aid. Get that shit away from him. No, they just shot him in the back of the head. Oh, <laughs> oh my no! God. It's the worst! Oh. Yeah, so it started out with those 12 guys and Mr. Muggs, but then they eventually got 60 members down there. But this was just normal people out there trying to tear down a jungle. <laughs> right. You know what I With mean? With no equi- heavy equipment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they flew in heavy ac- oh. equipment eventually, but at first it was just like... They just got their axes and they're just trying to do it. And meanwhile, there's like cheetahs hose. and <laughs> snakes yeah. going around. Well, that stuff's so thick. I mean, you're talking about the jungle. That's yeah. not an easy no. proposition. Yeah, I mean, the, the, and the trees were so dense and hard that it would just bust the chainsaws mm-hmm. when they were trying to saw them down. And the the Guyanese would just be watching them like that. You're never going to do it that way. So what they had to do was rock the trees back and forth to get them loose enough to pull them out of the ground. Yeah, that sounds fun. And then, like you said, there's snakes. There's jungle cats out there. Ugh. Fucking crazy bugs and shit. Fucking humidity. The worst of all of yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, it is amazing what they were able to accomplish down there to build to build Jonestown to what it was, you know. Hmm. Yeah. But uh, but yeah. So at this time, Greystone had stopped buying this shit, and in 1976, six, she uh, she snuck off and left her husband Tim Stone and her son John Victor behind because Tim was completely sold on Jim still, and there was no way she was going to be able to get out of there with her son. You know, I mean, there's right. just, it wasn't going to happen. Mm-hmm. Jim could talk all his shit and threaten defectors, but Grace was different. And like we were saying, the the custody battle of John Victor would be a huge factor in why the People's Temple ended. Jim saw the writing on the wall with, with John Victor, and before anything could happen, he put John Victor on a plane and flew him to Guyana. Just got him out of there. Because mm-hmm. he knew exactly that she was going to come at him for... You know, a custody battle with Tim and stuff. Another major defection in the story is Joyce Shaw and how Jim allegedly handled her defection. Her husband, Bob Houston, stayed a member of the temple when Joyce left. But it's suspected that instead of doing anything to Joyce, Jim took it out on Bob Houston instead. The official story is that while at work at a train yard, Bob fell asleep on the train tracks and was ran over by a train. You know, I often take naps on the train tracks. <laughs> yeah, of course. Very comfortable. Obviously, that's not believable at all. And Bob's father was an AP photographer and knew Congressman Leo Ryan, which that's the first time Leo Ryan had heard of the People's Temple and mm. got on his radar. Uh, why would he take it out on Bob Houston? Like, what was the point of that? What would that solve? Yeah, I don't know. It's alleged. There's no proof to back any of it up, you know. Well, there's there's audio recordings of that, isn't there? Where he's, he said, uh, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> You got me there because I was thinking, like, what what recordings? (laughs) That was something else. Never mind. I've seen that movie. I've seen that movie. Tom Hanks. So yeah, I mean now now there's there's a lot more defectors out there, and there's Grace Stone, which you know she's the big one, and there's stories of fraud using uh, money from government checks that were supposed to be going to uh, going to parents that were for foster kids. To fund Jonestown, you know, they're supposed to be getting, you know, they're fostering these kids. But in reality, those kids were now down in Jonestown working. Mm. So there's this government fraud, you know, with the checks going on, stuff, rumors with what's been going on in the planning commission. So with all those rumors, uh, Marshall Kilduff and Phil Tracy, they were two reporters for the New West magazine started looking into the People's Temple, and they had enough defectors that were pissed off enough to go on record. And in an article that was published in the monthly magazine New West, in one day, 
Marshall and Phil exposed every secret that Jim Jones had been hiding for all these years. And unlike the previous story got that got pulled, this one stuck. This one really hit hard. Who were these reporters with? Uh, New West New magazine. West. Okay. Well, it's about time somebody published this. Well, yeah. Shows you how important a free press is. And when was this? What year are we looking at here? Late 70s? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this would have been so 77. Which one to call it? Uh, Jimmy Carter's wife is still the first lady when this is coming yeah. out. Yeah. After she had already rubbed elbows and uh, spoke with him and on his behalf. Yeah, in part three, we'll touch on a, a brief letter that, that Jim writes to Jimmy Carter trying to get help. It's pretty mm. interesting. Ooh, nice little <laughs> teaser. That's a good <laughs> teaser. That got me excited. Yeah, so I Jim knew that the factors were talking. In a month before the article was released, he started ramping up people going to Jonestown, which it went from like it went from 60 members to pushing a thousand almost overnight. And Jim Jonestown was only built for like 500 people. It was never supposed to house more than five to six hundred mm-hmm. people. But at this point, he's just trying to get anyone out of there because yep. he sees the shit might be blowing up in his face. Oh yeah, he knew he knew that this was this article was this was going to be the end of this. Yeah. How they get down there? They just fly commercial. Greyhounds, dude. They had those Greyhound buses. <laughs> <laughs> so Mr. The, uh, Muggs worked it all out. <laughs> he was a logistics coordinator. <laughs> also. He was everything. <laughs> Mr. Muggs Travel Agency. <laughs> <laughs> so the day that that article was published and people started to really see what was going on with the People's Temple, Jim was already on a plane to Guyana. It would never come back to, to the U.S. again. And that's where we'll pick up on part three. And that's where we'll mm. final part of the Jonestown episodes. Yep. Quickly going off the rails, I believe, here. Even more so <laughs> off the rails, <laughs> yes. Okay. So. Ian, you got anything else for Jonestown? Anything else you want to add here or... No. Finish up? No, I think it's... Dave, you got anything else for this Jonestown topic? I uh, No, I don't believe yeah. I do. All right, any plugs? Fuck, I'm not ready like I was. I wasn't ready last week either. Um, you, you, you edit it, make it all sound pretty anyways. Uh, yeah, I just want to give a shout out to Witch of the West for an awesome uh, review on iTunes. Great. Um, Dave, you got any shout outs? You good? Uh, no. You good this week? I have nothing at all. You know... <laughs> I don't have her name in front of me, but I'd like to hear from the the young lady who has the Flavor Aid Jim Jones T shirt. I'm curious as to oh, if yeah. she likes these shows or not. Yeah, she hit us up. She was excited that she had a sweet uh, Flavor Aid T shirt. That was badass. Uh, Lisa Macaroni on Instagram. <laughs> there you go, Lisa she Macaroni. Was about it. She sent us. Uh, she has a sweet Flavor Aid T shirt. So <laughs> hopefully she's enjoying them. Uh, the episodes. We're, we're enjoying them, talking about them at least. Mm. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, we are at Necronomapod. If you're on uh, iTunes, if you have an iPhone, uh, hit us up, leave us a rating and review. Uh, we love seeing the, the, the reviews. Uh, we'll give you a shout out, and uh, it really helps us get more, um, more attention and get noticed. So hit us up on there, or if you're on one of the socials, uh, let us know what you think. I love uh, We love interacting with fans and uh, talking to you guys and seeing what you guys think about the episode. So hit us up there as well. Are you guys ready for a cool down beer? Let's Cheers. Go. Yep.